change this one thing remains one thing remains your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love never fails it never gives up it never runs out on me your love and on and on and on and on it goes and it overwhelms and satisfies my soul and i never ever have to be afraid this one one thing remains. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love in death in life, I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. My debt is paid, there's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love never fails. It never gives up. It never runs out on me. Your love. In death, in life, I'm confident and covered by the power of your great love. My debt is paid. There's nothing that can separate my heart from your great love. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your love never fails, it never gives up, it never runs out on me. Your you thankful for his great love. Amen. We're so glad you're here today to be with us. And we're going to take a few moments just to get around and shake hands this morning. If you haven't had a chance yet, we have our new children's pastors here with us, Michael and Ashley Lampkin. They're over here towards the front. If you want to take a chance to get to meet them this morning, and pastor will be introducing them in just a little while. So let's get around and shake hands.
Amen. Amen. If you're a visitor with us this morning, we're delighted that you chose to make Parkway Church of God your place to visit today. And if you'll notice there in the seat pocket in front of you, there's a connection card. If you wouldn't mind pulling one of those out, if you would fill it out for us. And in just a few minutes, when we come around taking the offering, you can place that in the offering plate so that our pastoral staff can recognize your visit with us today. One thing we'd like to do for all of our first-time guests is offer you a bar of chocolate to tide you over before lunch. So as you're leaving today, uh, Miss Denise, our pastor's wife, will be at the back door there, and she passes out bars of chocolate. So if you need a little chocolate fix for the day, see if you can sneak one out of her today. I um, want to draw your attention just to a few moments to some of our announcements in our bulletin. We have uh, quite a few events coming up that you want to be aware of. Uh, one of the things uh, Pastor Ray has asked me to mention this morning is anyone that is interested in their child or youth going to youth camp this summer. Uh, it is located down in Chattanooga, uh, Tennessee. And uh, we have that available. The applications are back at the table there if you want to get one of those and fill it out. It has the dates and the names and, and the age range for each week of camp this summer. And it's always a great opportunity. You don't want to have your kids miss out on going to youth camp. I spent my life in youth camp, and it was wonderful every summer. So you want to take advantage of that opportunity. We have a power-packed weekend next weekend. We're going to be celebrating the dedication of this building. And in light of that, we have several things coming up in that weekend that kicks off on Friday night with our Young at Cart group. They're going to be having their uh, fellowship function. You'll see it on the little flyer inside your bulletin there. Uh, Friday night at 6 p.m. It'll be over here in the fireside room. Bring your favorite foods and desserts. They say they're having a good time. They're going to play games, but they're not going to tell you what kind of games. I guess they're being all secretive about it. So if you want to know about the games that the Young at Heart crowd plays, you need to come and see what they're doing. They've also asked for you to bring some canned food uh, over the next couple of months to their functions to help out Sevier County Food Ministry. Uh, so if you'll be doing that. Uh, the next thing on that weekend is Saturday morning at 11 o'clock. We're going to be having a special prayer time over this property and our church grounds. So if you want to participate with pastor and the leaders of the church to come here on our property and as part of our dedication weekend, just us as a congregation to come together and offer up prayer and dedication ourselves over this property and this building, uh, you can be a part of that. And then at beginning Sunday morning, we're going to have our regular dedication service, and we have a special guest coming for that. Uh, Brother David Griffiths, he's the Assistant General Overseer for the Churches of God. There's going to be a fellowship meal that Sunday night uh, that you can sign up on what you're going to be bringing back there. The church provides the fried chicken and tea and paper products for that Sunday evening meal. And you can sign up for the desserts and side dishes you would like to bring. And in addition to the meal going on that night, we're having a water baptism service. Uh, here in the sanctuary. So anyone that's interested in being baptized in water, they can contact Pastor Morris and uh, let, the, let him know about that and, and be prepared for water baptism next Sunday night. It's time for our morning tithes and offering this morning. It's always a great opportunity to be able to give unto the Lord. And we just so appreciate your faithfulness and giving each and every Sunday as God has blessed you to give, that you are able to give. And we just thank the Lord for that. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we're so thankful for your presence. We already feel this morning, God. We thank you for the chance we have to be here in your presence, God, and to bring our tithes and offerings to you. It's a privilege to be able to give to you, Father, and we don't take that lightly. God, we just lift these offerings up to you, and we ask that you would bless them and use them for your service, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
comfort through all the hurt and pain. I am so. Anybody sold out today? Amen. I love the words, my heart is fixed, my mind's made up, no room, no vacancies, I'm all filled up, his spirit lives in me and that's the reason I'm sold out. Amen. Love it. We're so thankful today for each and every one of you that are here and uh, we have attendance books at the end of each row. If you don't mind, if you'll grab that attendance book and sign in and pass that down your row. We sure would appreciate you doing that so much. And as Shane mentioned earlier, uh, we are so looking forward to next weekend. It's going to be a wonderful celebration weekend, and I sure would love to have as many folks here as possible on Saturday at 11 a.m. We're going to just pray over the whole building and the grounds and, and uh, just really dedicate, uh, rededicate this building and grounds and property and everything here to the Lord. And then Sunday's just going to be an awesome time of celebration. I know we've already got confirmed that Mayor Larry Waters is going to be with us from Sevier County Mayor's Office and maybe some other dignitaries as well that will be with us. And, but most of all, we're going to be celebrating God's goodness and God's mercy and God's love and dedicating this property to the Lord afresh and anew. And it's going to be a great time of getting together Sunday night as well. And one of the reasons we wanted to also have our get-together Sunday night is to welcome our new children's pastor couple, and that's Michael and Ashley Lampkin. We're so glad y'all are here. Y'all come on up. <laughs> Michael and Ashley come to us from Poplar Bluff, Missouri. Yeah. Yeah. But you notice he already got converted to the big orange tea uh, before, before coming here. They used to live in Tennessee years ago, and I guess some of that Tennessee got into you, didn't it, Michael? We're so glad it did, and we're glad you're back. Uh, we're so thankful for Michael and Ashley, and Ashley is actually going to be uh, working at the Smoky Mountain Children's Home, and we're so excited for her ministry there. On the campus, on the care campus at the Smoky Mountain Children's Home, and Michael comes to us with lots of experience with children and uh, children's ministry. And uh, one of the things that's really 
wonderful about uh, this fresh start for them. They've been willing to leave all their family. This was their home church where they were in Poplar Bluff. They left their family and uh, brought little Peyton with them. Peyton is four or five now. He turned five. Peyton and I had a lot of fun yesterday on the playground. That's how I got sunburned on the top of my head. But uh, we had a good time yesterday. And uh, they left their family, and they've been willing to move here and help us kind of reboot and restart in our children's ministry area. So we're so thankful for them and so glad that they're here. And I want to encourage all of you to really quickly make them family uh, because we're so glad they're here, aren't we, Parkway? We're so thankful for them. They're going to be headed over to Children's Church in just a little bit to get acquainted with the kids, and Pastor Ray's going to be introducing them over there. But before they do that, I wanted us to have special prayer for them during this time of transition and pray for them personally and also for our children's ministry as we kind of relaunch in that area. We're so thankful for everything God is doing for them and also for us in this transition time. So would you stretch your hands this way, and let's just... Lift up Michael and Ashley to the Lord. Hallelujah. Father, you are so good, and we're so thankful for Michael and Ashley and Peyton being willing to come here. What a blessing, Father. And we're already just thrilled that they're here. And Father, we believe that they are here for such a time as this. We believe that this is a moment of destiny for them and for our congregation. We believe that this is a time of new beginnings, Lord, and that you have placed a harvest here, a beautiful harvest of children and their families that, that you desire to reach with your love and mercy and grace. Father, we're asking, Father, for your hand to be upon them, Lord, with their family, especially with, with Peyton as he makes the transition here, Lord, and also Michael and Ashley as she starts her new job at the CARE campus. Father, we're just asking for your hand to be upon them in a mighty and wonderful way, Lord, draw them closer to you than they've ever been before. Draw them closer to one another than they've ever been before. And then, Father, we pray for this area of ministry with our congregation that it would just be a, a fresh beginning, a new start. Lord, that you would just touch this area of children's ministry. Lord, as, as Michael begins to reach out here with our church kids and, and also with the kids here at our child care. And, Father, reach into the community to reach kids and their families in, here in our community. We're just asking that you do a wonderful, mighty, awesome work, Lord. And we're believing you for that. We've already been praying it, and we've already been asking you for it. And now, Father, we're just excited to, to open our eyes of faith because we know we're going to see it, Lord. We know we're going to see it happen. And we thank you, Lord, for giving us this privilege of, of hosting them and their family, Lord. And we just rise up and bless them in the name of Jesus. And we bless their family, Lord. We bless them and ask you to bless them spiritually and mentally, emotionally, physically, financially, relationally, in every way, Father. We pray your blessing on them, and we thank you for them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. All right. Well, you guys can... Head on over to the fun part of the building, the children's church. Y'all have fun. Save a little fun for us later. All right, can we stand together and let's just go ahead and, and worship the Lord together. Can we just go ahead and lift up a hand clap and a shout of praise to the King of kings and Lord of lords. Thank you, Lord. We bless you. We praise you. We honor you, Lord. Hallelujah. Seated above, enthralled in the Father's love, destined to die, poured out for all mankind. God's only Son, perfect and spotless one. He never sinned, but suffered as if he did. All authority, every victory is yours. All authority, every victory is yours. of all 
all of our praise you overcame Jesus awesome in power forever awesome and great is your name you overcame power in hand speaking the father's You're sending us out, light in this broken land. All authority, every victory is yours. All authority, every victory. Jesus, awesome in power forever, awesome and great is your name, you overcame. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Everyone overcome. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Everyone overcome. Savior, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all of Jesus, awesome and power forever, awesome and great is your name, you overcame. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Everyone overcome. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Everyone overcome. Savior, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all. Jesus, awesome in power forever, awesome and great is your name, you overcame, you overcame, you overcame.
rejoice this morning. I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad. There is a fountain and it's full of grace and it flows from Emmanuel's veins. It came and it healed me. It came and it filled me. It came and it washed my sins away. I will rejoice. I will rejoice. I will rejoice and be glad. See, there is a fountain, and it's full of grace, and it still flows from Emmanuel's veins. It came and it healed me. It came and it filled me. Wash my sins away, and I will rejoice, I will rejoice, and be glad. I will rejoice, I will rejoice, and be glad. I will rejoice. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We serve an awesome God, the maker of the universe, tells us to call him Abba Father. In my language, that says Daddy. We're to call him Daddy. I don't know about you that have children, but when my children were little, some of the best moments were at night, they're a little tired, a little sleepy. They'd want to crawl up in your lap, and they'd just want to put their head right here and just lay there for a moment. Ah, they're older now, got teenagers, but they still every now and again will come up next to me on the couch. Can't crawl in the lap anymore, but they'll get up as close as they can, get my arm around them, and they still put their head just right here. The God of this universe, the maker of heaven and earth, sometimes wants his children just to climb up in his lap and put their head right here because it's in that moment that we can hear and feel his heart and know his will. We want to sing this simple song with you this morning. It's a song for you just to have that intimate moment with God that we so desperately need. Sometimes we just need to pause and just have that time with Him. So forget about what you're doing after church. Forget about the rest of the day. Don't worry about the person beside you. This is just you and God in this moment. This love is so deep, 
It's more than I can stand. I melt in your peace. It's overwhelming. The more I seek you, the more I find you. The more I find you, the more I love you. I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand, lay back against you and breathe, feel your heart beat. This love is so deep, it's more than I can stand. I melt in your peace, it's overwhelming. Jesus. The, the more I seek you, The more I find you, the more I find you, the more I love you. I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand, lay back again you and breathe feel your heart beat this love is so deep it's more than i can stand i melt in your peace it's overwhelming this love is so deep it's more than i can stand I melt in your peace, it's overwhelming. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Father, we worship you. Lord, our love for you is so deep, Father. We just love you, Lord. Can we make that our prayer right now? I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand, lay back against you and breathe, feel your heart beat. This love is so deep, it's more than I can stand, I melt in your peace. It's overwhelming. I want to sit at your feet. Is that your prayer? Drink from the cup in your hand. Lay back against you and breathe. Feel your heart beat. This love is so deep. It's more than I can stand. I melt in your peace, it's overwhelming. Can we do that right now? Can we just climb up in his lap? You might want to raise your hands. You might want to lift your eyes to the heavens, whatever way you want to do it right now. Let's just draw near to him. Father, we love you. <laughs> You're so awesome, Lord. You've been so good to us, Lord. You're just awesome all by yourself, let alone all the awesome things you've done for us. Lord, I just think about what you've done for me. Hallelujah. How you've saved me and you've rescued me and you've delivered me and you've set me free. You've healed me. Hallelujah. You've sanctified me. You've filled me with your Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. I thank you, Lord. I thank you, Lord. And Father, we, we know that you're here, Lord, because you love us, Lord. You have given your son Jesus because you love us. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son 
Father, we thank you for that precious gift of your Son. And we draw near to you now through your Son, Jesus Christ, and by the power of your Holy Spirit. We just lay everything else aside. And we just run to you, O Abba Father. We just run right into the kingly courtroom. Even though you're a king, you've invited us to come in as your adopted sons and daughters to just run right into the courtroom and cry out, Abba Father, to our Abba Father, the King of kings and Lord of lords. So we do that right now. We just run right in. We run right in. We lay everything else aside. And we run right in to our Abba Father. And we say, Abba Father, we love you. We love you, Daddy. We love you, Abba Father. We bless you. We praise you. We worship you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Church, would you just do that? Would you just speak those words of praise to him right now? Just, just tell him that you love him right now. Would you do that? I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand, lay back against you and breathe, feel your heart beat. This love is so deep, it's more than I can stand. I melt in your peace. It's overwhelming. You know, some of us have come in today with a lot on our mind, a lot on our hearts. Some of us have come in really bowed down with, with cares and, and things that are going on in our lives. But you know what? No matter what you've brought in here today, the God of all comfort, the God of all grace is able to touch you and meet you right where you are this morning. I just want to encourage you. No matter what's been going on this week, no matter what's going on in your life right now, some of you are, are in the midst of crisis. Some of us are in the midst of really great times, mountaintop experiences. Others of us are, are in the valley right now. But you know what? No matter where we are, he is able to meet us right where we are and speak that word that we need, that word in season. I want to encourage you right now just to open up your heart and let him meet you right where you are right now. Just unload it right now. Just, just cast all of your cares on him because he cares for us. He's told us to throw them all on him. He's wanting to touch each one of us today. Would you do that right now? Just throw all of your cares. Throw, cast all of your cares on him and let him touch you. Let him meet you right where you are right now. Father, we do that right now. Those of us that are in the midst of difficult times, those of us, Lord, that are in family situations that, that we're really struggling with, Lord, those of us that are having a tough time, maybe at school or a tough time on the job, Lord, there's things going on in our lives, personal relationships. Lord, I don't know what every person here today is facing, but I know that whatever that load is, you told us to throw it off on you. You are big enough. You are strong enough. Nothing is too hard for you. Nothing is too difficult for you. So right now, we just give it all to you. Right now, we lay it all at your feet because, Lord, you're big enough to take care of every bit of it. Father, that's what we're asking you to do. Father, I ask you to sweep through this room right now with the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. I'm asking that you blow the wind of your Holy Spirit right through this room, right through the hearts of your people. Father, reinvigorate, refresh, renew, transform by the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. Lift up those that are bowed down. Strengthen those that are weak. Encourage those that are discouraged. Father, I'm asking you to do this by the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. Loose those that are captives, Lord. Those, Father, that are brokenhearted, bind them up with the love of your Holy Spirit. Father, I'm asking you to do it, Lord. I'm asking you to cleanse those that need cleansing. Wash those that need washing. Renew those that need renewing. Strengthen those that need strengthening. Encourage those that need encouraging. Father, nothing's too hard for you. Nothing's too difficult for you. 
And we're trusting you for, for this right now. We're believing you for this. We sense that presence and power of your Holy Spirit, and we breathe in. Hallelujah. We drink in the presence and power of your Holy Spirit. Your word says that you've given us all one spirit to drink. So, Father, we're hungry. We're thirsty. We're not for food of this world, not for drink of this world. But we're hungry and thirsty for you. So, Father, we pull up to the table that you've set before us right now. And we receive from the bounty of heaven. We receive from the outpouring of your Holy Spirit. We receive from your presence. Hallelujah. We want to look in your face. We want to hear your voice in our ears. We want to hear your heartbeat, Lord. We want to feel your breath on our face, Lord. As you breathed into your disciples and you said, receive the Holy Spirit. We receive your Holy Spirit today. We receive your presence. We receive your provision. Father, so often we've come to you with a checklist. But Father, today we just want to give you us. We give you us, Lord. We present our bodies as, as living sacrifices to you. We give you everything, Lord. We don't want to just sing about being sold out. We literally, Lord, we want to give everything to you, Lord. We give it all to you, Lord. Hallelujah. I want to sit at your feet, drink from the cup in your hand, lay back against you and breathe, feel your heart beat. This love is so deep, it's more than I can stand, I melt in your peace. It's overwhelming. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Dylan, would you come on up and let's have prayer for Dylan. Dylan's having surgery this week, and we're just going to ask God to touch him and help him. Would you stretch your hands this way? Father, you see this surgery, and you know this injury that Dylan's had. But, Father, we're asking for, for healing for him. We do pray for the doctors and the nurses and all those that are going to be involved in this very important surgery. And Father, we're asking that you put your hand on them and use them for your glory and for your honor and that no harm would come to him in any way, only blessings and good things through this surgery. We plead the blood of Jesus over him, ask you to send your holy angels to stand guard and stand watch over him, guard him, protect him, keep him safe, watch over him, be with him. But Father, we're praying above and beyond that. We're appealing to the great physician. Hallelujah. We're asking, Father, for healing. We're asking for a supernatural recovery, for speedy recovery. Father, I remember back years ago when I had back surgery, and, Lord, you gave me a supernatural recovery, and the doctors then and ever since then have been amazed at how I've done. And, Father, I know it was you. Thank you, Lord. And you're able to do that for Dylan. We're asking you to do it for him, a supernatural recovery, a speedy recovery, Lord. Father, that he'll be able to just continue to, to run around and do everything that, that he wants to do for you and for your kingdom, Lord. And we're trusting you for that. We're believing you for that. We're thanking you for it. We're praising you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Trust in the Lord for you, Dylan. Amen. Would you ladies just gather around Barbara right there? Barbara's having surgery as well this week. Father, we lift Barbara up to you, and we thank you for how you've been giving her healing. And, Lord, you touched her, Lord, in the last surgery, and now this next one. We're asking that you do it again. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Lord. Lord, after years of problems, Lord, you're giving her relief, Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, we're asking again for the doctors and nurses for you to put your hand on them. But, Father, we're also asking... We're appealing to the great physician, Lord. We're asking for healing, for health and wholeness for Barbara in Jesus' name. 
And Father, that this would be a completely successful surgery. And Lord, a supernatural recovery, a speedy recovery in Jesus' name. And Father, you see her sister Patty at home right now running 103 temperature. Lord, we'll just pray right now as Barbara stands in for Patty. We're asking for you to break this fever in the name of Jesus and bring healing to Patty right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Nothing's too hard for you. Nothing's too difficult for you. And we trust you for it, Lord. We're reminded of how Jesus broke the fever of of Peter's mother-in-law as he just prayed for her and the fever was broken. We pray it would be that way right now for Patty. In the name of Jesus, let it be so. Father, in Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. What's your need today? Let's just lift up our needs to him right now. Father, we lift up every need to you. You are the one who supplies. You are the one who meets and supplies every need according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So right now, with simple childlike faith, we just lift up every need to you, and we ask for your divine intervention, Lord in our individual lives, in our families, in our church, in in our city, our county, our state, our nation. Father, we're lifting up every need to you. And Lord, the needs from around the globe, the folks on our prayer list, we lift up every need to you, Father. And we are asking you, believing you, trusting you, and we receive the answer to these prayers by faith right now in the name of Jesus by whose stripes we were healed, by whose blood we were saved, by whose resurrection we have been empowered to live a godly life, by whose outpouring of the Holy Spirit we have everything we have need of for life and godliness. So, Father, right now in the name of Jesus, we give you all the glory and honor and praise, and we go ahead and thank you in advance for hearing and answering prayer in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Come on, church. Let's bless him. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Before you sit down, why don't you remind two or three folks how good God is. Remind them God is good. Amen. Amen. Isn't God good? Can we just remind him that we know that? Lord, you are good. Hallelujah. You are good. We bless you, Lord. Amen. I'd like for you, if you would, to open your Bibles, your iPads, your iPhone, or whatever way you look at the Word, to Ephesians chapter 5. I started speaking last week about real marriage And I I felt like I needed to continue this week talking about real marriage. I do need to kind of give you a little disclaimer like I did last week that uh, discussing this topic has conversations that might not be real appropriate for very young kids. If you've got any real young kids in, you might want to take them to children's church. Older kids have these conversations a lot probably in high school and talk about these things, but um, the reality is that we're living in a day that is attempting to redefine what real marriage is. We talked last week from Mark chapter 6, we talked about how John the Baptist lost his head standing up for real marriage. Then we looked at Mark chapter 10 and saw what Jesus said about real marriage and how that he quoted all the way back from the very beginning of the Bible, Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, about what real marriage really is. 
Today, I'd like for us to start out by looking at what the Apostle Paul says about real marriage in Ephesians chapter 5, and we're going to see that the Apostle Paul does exactly like Jesus did in going back to the beginning, going back to Genesis chapter 2 to define what real marriage is all about. And I'd like to throw in some things today that I did not get to talk about last week some things that are very important, I think, as we move forward in the coming days, the realization is that uh, the landscape of our nation has been changing, and uh, Tennessee and Ohio, Michigan, and Kentucky are all presenting before the United States Supreme Court on Tuesday, April 28th at 10 a.m., presenting their case for keeping their real marriage laws on the books and in their state constitutions. That's all before the U.S. Supreme Court on April 28th, Tuesday at 10 a.m. So be praying about that. But the reality is that we are living in a time where we need to be prepared to love people but not compromise our stand in the Lord. To love people but to not compromise in our stand with the Lord. Would you pause and pray with me, and let's open our hearts to prepare to receive the word today. Father, thank you for your word. Your word is quick and sharp and powerful. Hallelujah. And Father, your word is alive. And we're asking that you change us and transform us by your word today. Open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, our minds our souls, our spirits, our bodies, to receive the living word of God today. Father, may we not be conformed to this world, but instead let us be transformed by the renewing of our minds through your word. And let it be so, I pray. Touch me, touch all of us. As we open your word together, open us up with your word, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 25. I know the husbands all wish that I would start in verse 22, but I figure that the wives have heard that enough. I'm going to talk starting at verse 25. Ephesians 5, 25. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. Wow. Wow. So Paul immediately makes a comparison between husbands and wives and Christ and the church. Husbands loving their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, for the church. Well, I don't know if I ought to just listen to this today, Philip. I'm not married. I'm not planning on getting married anytime soon. I'm young or I've decided I'm not going to get married, et cetera, et cetera. Well, maybe one day you might get married. But let me tell you something. You're going to be surrounded by people who are going to try to tell you and tell us what marriage really is and what marriage is not. So the question is, more than even the church, the family is really the backbone of civilization. When you go back to creation, what did God create first? In the creation, did he create the church first? No. He created man and woman in his own image. So the reality is that that marriage, real marriage, is even more foundational to our society in some ways than even the church. Now, I'm not trying to slight the church's importance, but you understand that the building block of creation, the building block of all civilization is the real couple, the real marriage, the real family. Now, notice how Paul continues. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. 
that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. So husbands ought to love their own wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as the Lord does the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. Verse 31, now listen, Paul does just like Jesus and goes back to Genesis chapter 2 and quotes the original plan for real marriage. Here it is. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. The man shall leave who? His father and mother, and cleave to who? Be joined with who? His wife. So a man and his wife. Can you help me like you did last week? A man and his wife. Can we try that again? A man and his wife. Now see, we're, we're on the precipice right now. If the United States Supreme Court decides that so-called same-sex marriage is just as legitimate as what this says marriage is, our whole nation, all 50 states, will be flooded with legal marriage that involves something other than a man and his. You understand there's already lawsuits in several states that even go beyond the parameters of what the U.S. Supreme Court is discussing. There's already been a lawsuit regarding polygamy. More than one person married to more than another person. Several of those lawsuits out west. People who want to be married to more than one person. There's also, down in Florida, been a lawsuit already concerning and this is part of the language I'm not trying to uh, be gross, but here it is, consensual incestuous relationships where people who are related to one another marry each other, and it's legal. There's already a lawsuit that's been filed to try to make that happen. You see, here's the issue. Once you leave the original once you leave the genuine, there's no limit to the amount of counterfeits that the world and the devil can come up with. The reality is that once you leave the original, everything else is a counterfeit. You've heard it before. The U.S. Department of Treasury does not cha train their agents by showing them counterfeit money as to how to find counterfeit money. They train their agents by showing them real money and, and inspecting the real money, and this is what the real money looks like. And when they know what the real money looks like, they're able to detect the counterfeit just like that. See, it's the same here. When you know what the original, what the real, what the genuine is, you'll be able to detect what the counterfeit is immediately. Paul goes on to say in verse 32, This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So before he closes out, you notice he said something to the husbands, and he said something to the wives. So I guess since we just finished this chapter, all the husbands and the wives can say amen. Amen. And that's better than throwing elbows, I think. When I read some of that earlier, I think that's what was going on a little bit. Okay, so 
So we've looked at what Jesus said is the real thing, the genuine, in Mark chapter 10, Genesis chapter 1, Genesis chapter 2, what Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5. Okay, so then, then what does Jesus say then about the counterfeits? What are the counterfeits to real marriage, and what does Jesus say about that? Turn with me to Mark chapter 7, verse 21. Mark 7, 21. Now, Jesus is not just talking about counterfeits for marriage, but he does talk about them here. He also talks about a whole list of other, should I say what it is? Sins. Sins. What are sins? Sins are when you know you ought to be doing something and you don't do it. Sins are when you know you shouldn't be doing something, but you do it anyway. Sin is when you sin, you do something wrong against God, or you do something wrong against someone else, or you do something wrong against yourself. That's what sin is. And we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. The wages of sin is death, but God has made an arrangement. Hallelujah. The gift of God is eternal life through who? Through Jesus Christ. And how did that happen? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but will have everlasting life. And and Romans 10 says if you confess the Lord Jesus with your mouth and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So there is a solution for sin. Here's Here's the problem Many people don't really like the solution. Now, yesterday, I was uh, playing with little Peyton, the Lampkins' little boy, our new children's pastor, little boy, playing with him out on the uh, playground, and we were having fun. Now, Miss Anna, Anna Husky, y'all know Dr. Anna? Yes. She came out a couple times to the playground. Now, are you supposed to be in the sun? Uh, Do you need to find a place in the shade? Came out with a bottle of water. Where's your hat? Uh, I don't think you're supposed to be in the sun this much. Well, what did I do? I love Anna, but I didn't listen to her. So now I have the... uh, kind of the -the glow-in-the-dark, golden globe, bald-headed, sunburn on the top of my head thing going on. Why? Because I didn't listen to what I should have been doing. Now, we all have at times not listened to what we should be doing either. I remember when I was a kid, My parents, especially my mama, she always wanted me to clean my plate, especially those things called fruits and vegetables. And there were many times I did not want to eat those fruits or vegetables, especially the vegetables, especially these things called tomatoes. For some reason, I just, something, you know, it just didn't sit right with me. And I didn't like those things. And I remember one time I was sitting at the counter, And she said, you're not leaving this seat or this plate till you eat that tomato. It was a little cherry tomato. I had eaten everything else. Did any of y'all have mean moms like that, mean mommies? Made you do stuff? I saw that, Sharon. (laughs) Yeah. Now, did, did they make us eat our vegetables because they hated us? Did they make us eat our vegetables because they just wanted to be mean and torture us? Okay, don't say anything right now. No. They wanted us to get something good down inside of our system instead of Twinkies and Ho-Hos and Tasty Cakes and all that stuff that we love to eat. Some of y'all don't even know what I'm talking about, like I'm speaking some strange language. And so 
butterscotch crimpets, weren't they good? You, you know, y'all remember those. Man, I, we loved eating that stuff, but the, the fresh vegetables and the, and the fruits, lots of times we just wanted to leave them on the plate. See, here's the thing. There's a reason that God shows us the difference between the real and the counterfeit. You want to know why? It's because he loves us. He wants us to do what's going to take care of us. He wants us to do the stuff, you know, that's going to keep you from getting your bald head sunburned. He wants you, he wants you to do the stuff that's going to get healthy food down inside of you. Now, the way that people look at God is not that way. The way people look at God is, you're so mean. You're making me eat something that I don't like. You're so mean. You want me to wear a hat when I don't want to. You're so mean. We, we look at God as if he's mean, as if he's trying to rain on our parade, as if he's trying to spoil everything that we're doing. And here's the reality. The only reason he tells us to do this and to not do this is because he loves us. He wants to take care of us. And the reality is that all of his laws, all of his commands are for a reason. And the reason is that he loves us and he wants to take good care of us. He's our Abba Father. In fact, the Ten Commandments, what we call the Ten Commandments, we start with the to-do and the to-don't list, but the reality is that the Ten Commandments start with a word of freedom. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt. Before he ever gives a to-do or a to-don't, he reminds them, I'm trying to set you free here, people. I'm trying to set you free from all of that murder and all of that adultery and all of that stuff that was normal in Egypt, I'm trying to make you different. I'm trying to set you free. I'm trying to make you into something awesome, something wonderful. I'm trying to preserve you for my absolute best plan for your life. So I'm trying to tell you what the difference is between the original and between the counterfeit. I want you to know what the real is and what the fake is. I don't want you falling for the fake or the counterfeit because it's going to mess up my plan for your life. I've got awesome plans for you, plans to give you good things, plans to prosper you, plans to do all kinds of great things with your life, but I need you to get with the program. Got a few amens on that one. Praise the Lord. So here's the reality. He loves us so much that he's willing to tell us what we shouldn't do. Or what we should do. Why? Because he wants us to thrive and prosper and experience awesome and wonderful things. So look at Mark chapter 7. And Jesus starts talking about the counterfeits. Verse 21. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, Fornications, the word fornication comes from the Greek word pornos. It's where we get our word pornography, pornographic. It's any type of sexuality that is outside the boundaries of real marriage between one man and one woman. It's the general classification for all types of sexual sin, no matter what they might be. Now, adultery is a more specific title. But fornication covers everything that is not according to the original plan of God, marriage between one man and one woman. That means, can I be blunt? Abstinence before marriage and faithfulness in marriage. Abstinence before marriage faithfulness in marriage if you don't know what abstinence means i'll let you look it up 
For from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. Verse 23, all these evil things come from within and defile a man. Now, what's Jesus talking about? When something is defiled, that means that it's spoiled. That means that the original plan or intent for something is messed up. So when someone or something gets defiled, that means that there's no way that it can fulfill God's plan A for the life. Well, Philip, I'm going to tell you, I've come from a life of outright sin and debauchery. I've blown it. I've messed up. I've done all kinds of stuff I shouldn't do, sexually and otherwise. Here's the good news for you. Jesus gives everybody a brand new start through the cross of Jesus Christ, by the blood of Jesus. You can experience a brand new beginning for your life. You no longer have to be bound by the sins of the past, by the counterfeits that you sold out to in previous years in your life or whatever's happened in your life that you've blown it, you've messed up. Hey, guess what? That's the reason Jesus gave his life. That's the reason that God loved you so much is so that you could be forgiven from those things and so that you could get back to plan A, get back to the real plan that God has for your life. Now, there's times when we do spoil plan A. But I serve a God who's a God of second chances. Hallelujah. He, it may be that you messed up plan A, but he'll get you back, and he's got a good plan B for you. And it may be that you blessed up on, on plan B, but then he'll get you back where you need to be for a good plan C. You may have blown it. You may have messed up, but he's the God of second chances, third chances, fourth chances. He's able to take what's broken and messed up and bring it back and renew it and recycle it and make it something awesome. Praise God. That's good news. So the counterfeits that Jesus talked about here, especially the counterfeits in regards to marriage, basically he's saying that anything except the original, one man and one woman for marriage, anything except that is a counterfeit. It's a false substitute. It's not the original. Now, Look with me, if you will, at 1 Corinthians chapter 6 because I want you to see that the Apostle Paul does the same thing. He talks about the counterfeits. He talks about the false substitutes, and uh, he does it very clearly, maybe even more specifically than Jesus did. 1 Corinthians 6, 1 Corinthians 6, beginning with verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. That's pretty specific. I mean, there may be a few categories he left out, but I'm, tr- I'm trying hard, and I don't see too many he left out here. These are the false counterfeits. Someone who lives in adultery is not living according to the plan that God has for one man and one woman to be married and for there to be faithfulness in that marriage. Someone who's living according to homosexuality is not living according to the original plan of one man and one woman in marriage. Someone who's a sodomite. Anybody remember Sodom and Gomorrah in the Old Testament and how God wiped them out? But he would have saved Sodom and Gomorrah if it were for ten righteous people. 
So there is hope for America, folks. No matter what flood tide of evil is going on, if there's a righteous remnant who's crying out to God, God is still able to intervene. So, so those that are adulterers, those that are homosexuals, those that are sodomites, and, and all these other categories, uh, it's not plan A. It's not the best plan. It's not God's best for your life. In fact, the first category that he, that he mentions is actually the key, I think. Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, uh, second category, nor idolaters. Remember, fornicators covers all sexual sin outside of one man and one woman marriage. But notice he says he throws idolaters right in there. What's an idolater? Someone who worships an idol. Someone who worships something other than God himself. And here's the reality. If we're honest, everybody who is not following plan A that God has ordained for one man and one woman for marriage, and that being the context for genuine sexuality, proper sexuality, holy sexuality, anyone who's doing anything other than that plan, God's plan in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, is an idolater. Why do you say that, Philip? Because you're doing what you want to do instead of what God wants you to do. You know what I did with that tomato on my plate? When my mom wasn't looking... I took it, and I rolled it under the hutch. It disappeared. And then I acted like I was, mm, 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 you know, chewing it. Oh, Philip, I can't believe you would do that. Honey, you ain't heard the half of it. I don't know how long that tomato stayed there. I know that we moved several years later, and I'm sure someone found the remnants of it at some point and probably said, what in the world happened here? You see, I decided I was going to do it my way instead of my mama's way. Confession is good for the soul, isn't it? That's what idolatry is. Instead of doing it God's way, I'm going to do it some other way. My way or what some other religion says or what some other version of marriage says. Hey, folks, here's the reality. The reality is that any way except God's way is not God's best for your life. God has a best for your life. And I want to encourage every one of, of our young people especially, don't you dare compromise and sell out to what some teenage boy says you ought to be doing or some teenage girl says you ought to be doing or, or somebody's saying, putting pressure on you to be this or do that. I give you permission if they try too much, you just go ahead and slap them. And get out of Dodge and remind them that's not God's best for my life. You can tell them to go take a long walk off a short pier. You can go take, tell them to just take a little leap off a very, very high cliff. Whatever you want to do. But if they're trying to mess with you, if they're trying to get you to sell out for something other than God's best for your life, you tell them to hit the highway. Give them the swift right foot of fellowship and get them out the door, whatever you got to do. If they're trying to get you to sell out to something other than God's best for your life, no way, Jose. I wasn't born yesterday. You're not going to have your way with me and then brag on it at, about it at school tomorrow. You're going you're gonna, to uh, learn a little bit of swift justice, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make things a little crazy for you right now because you, you are not going to mess with God's plan for my life. 
some of you folks need to start loving yourself like God loves you and start taking up for yourself. You, you remember the golden rule, love your neighbor as you love yourself? And here's this boy or this girl. You notice I have to say boy or girl whether I'm talking to a boy or a girl now. Some of y'all will get that later. But it's a, it's a sad state of affairs. But some boy or some girl is talking to you, boy or girl, and they're trying to fix whatever pain they've got in their life. Listen, their pain's not going to help your pain. Somebody, you can, you can introduce them to Jesus or somebody else can introduce them to Jesus, but Jesus has come to take care of your pain and you don't have to solve your pain by throwing your life away. You can rise up and fulfill the plan, the purpose, the destiny, the calling that God has for your life without compromise. I didn't get an amen, so I better move on. But now notice how Paul continues. Verse 11, and such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Notice what Paul says. Hey, some of y'all were the same way until Jesus got a hold of you. So nobody gets to condemn anybody. Nobody gets to rant and rail on people. The reality is that we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. Nobody gets to throw stones at anybody else. That takes me to the next verse I'd like for you to see, John chapter 8. John chapter 8. Here's the problem. How do we as believers, love people but still not compromise where we need to stand? John chapter 8, beginning with verse 2. Now early in the morning he came again into the temple, and all the people came to him, and he sat down and taught them. Then the scribes and Pharisees brought to him a woman caught in adultery. Isn't it interesting that they only brought the woman? That's another topic for later. And when they had set her in the midst, they said to him, Teacher, this woman was caught in adultery in the very act. Well, where's the guy? Sorry. Verse 5. Now Moses in the law commanded us that such should be stoned. But what do you say? This they said, testing him, that they might have something of which to accuse him. But Jesus stooped down and wrote on the ground with his finger as though he did not hear So when they continued asking him, he raised himself up and said to them, He who is without sin among you, let him throw a stone at her first. In other words, everybody's sin, everybody's fallen short of the glory of God. None of us has the right to stone someone who has blown it. Are you willing to admit today that all have sinned, that you've sinned? And maybe you didn't sin like so-and-so. Maybe you're not guilty of homosexuality or adultery or fornication or whatever other category we've been talking about. But maybe you've been guilty of some other things. Listen, sin is sin. And all have sinned. So none of us has the right to pick up a stone to stone someone who has been caught in their sin. Verse 8. And again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. Then those who heard it, being convicted by their conscience, went out one by one, beginning with the oldest, even to the last. And Jesus was left alone, and the woman standing in the midst. When Jesus had raised himself up and saw no one but the woman, he said to her, listen, 
Woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. I'm going to stop before I finish reading. Because some of us, in our fight for real marriage, in our fight to try to define who we are, in our, in our desire to stand up for what is right and what the Word of God says, if we're not careful, we will be condemning the very people that Christ died for. Did you hear me? The most radical, violent, extremist sinner you can think of, Christ died for them. Just like he died for you. And I don't care what sin they're in the middle of committing. And if the jury has already met and they've been found guilty, you and I have no right to act as though we have never sinned and condemn that person who is in sin. But Jesus doesn't stop there. He says, woman, where are those accusers of yours? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said to her, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. One translation says, go and now on, from now on, sin no more. Now here's the difference. There's folks in society who are now persecuting Christians for simply believing that marriage should be between one man and one woman. We are now on the defensive. Bakers are being sued because they won't bake a cake for a same-sex wedding. Photographers are being sued because they won't take pictures at a same-sex wedding. Caterers are being sued. You, you've heard the news. So now, everyone's chiming in, you don't have the right to condemn me. You're right, I don't. But because I love you so much, I'm not willing to pretend that you're not in sin. Jesus did not pretend that this woman caught in adultery was not in sin. He didn't come up to this woman and say, oh, that's okay, honey. That's, that's all right. I know you have a problem with adultery, and I'm here for you. We'll get through this together, and... You just keep living how you're living, and, and I'll be here for you. No, that's not what he said. He didn't tell her to continue in adultery, did he? Why? Because he loved her. He didn't want to see her life continually messed up by encounters that were going to take her down the wrong path. He loved her so much that he was willing to do two things. He was willing to refuse to condemn her, but he was also willing to say, stop. There's a better path. There's a better plan. There's a better purpose for your life. God's got something better for you. He's got, he's got plan A. He's got the best, the absolute best plan for you. So don't keep going down the path you're going. Don't keep on sinning like you've been sinning. Hey, I, I've been there. I, I've been a sinner before, and until Jesus got a hold of my life, 
There's a whole list of stuff that I used to do, and there's a whole list of stuff that I've struggled with, and there's even been times since Jesus got a hold of my life where I've still blown it and I've still messed up, but I've run back to him, and Jesus got me off of that path and got me on a new path. It's a path called life. It's a path called abundance. It's a path called good. It's a path called right. It's a path called holy. It's a path called righteous. It's a path called awesome. And he got me off of the path that you've been on and got me on this new wonderful path. And God's got an awesome path for you, a wonderful new plan, a new, a new passage in life where you can actually be everything that God has called you to be. It's an awesome plan. So I love you enough to not condemn you and not pretend that I haven't blown it myself, but I also love you enough to encourage you that there's something better for you. There's a better plan for your life. Philip, I've tried. And every time I've tried to change, I've blown it again. Hey, listen. There's no way any of us can have lasting change in our lives except through Jesus. That's the only way it's going to happen. And even then, sometimes it's pretty tough Some people want to tell you, oh, just come to Jesus and it'll all be just, woo. That's not what Jesus said. Jesus said, if you want to come after me, deny yourself, take up your cross, and follow me. In other words, you're not going to get to keep doing everything you want to do. You're not going to get to keep being who you've been And you don't get to go where you've been going. If you really want radical change in your life and you want my absolute best for you, you've got to deny yourself. You've got to be willing to take up a a cross and follow me into a new life where your old man dies and Jesus comes alive inside of you. For I have been crucified together with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but not I, but Christ lives in me. And what life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, the one loving me and the one giving himself up for me. That's the only way it can happen. That's the only way that we can move from the sinful path to the awesome path, from the unholy path to the holy path, from the unrighteous path to the righteous path from God's best. He's got his best path. Don't let yourself settle over here. He's got something awesome for you. So, Philip, how do we treat all these people that are trying to mess with what real marriage is supposed to be about? Love them. In fact, I'm going to encourage you to get radical. Jesus was a friend of sinners. Aren't you glad? Or have you forgotten that you used to be a sinner too? Jesus was a friend of sinners. Now, he didn't just come alongside sinners and say, oh, that's okay. Remember when he went to Zacchaeus' house? He was a tax collector and a sinner. And before the meal was done, Zacchaeus said, wow, I've been here with Jesus and I'm going to change my ways. I'm going to sell a bunch of stuff and I'm going to give the proceeds to the poor and I'm going to pay back the folks that I've cheated. Wow. So So when Zacchaeus the sinner spent time with Jesus, it wasn't Jesus who changed. It was Zacchaeus who changed. So we don't have to compromise when we spend time with sinners. We've been a sinner. So we can be friends with sinners and share with sinners the love of God, the great plan that God has for their life. In fact, I would encourage you and challenge you, and I'm speaking to myself. If you don't have any friends in your life who are sinners, 
you've stopped being like Jesus. Hello. What good is this light inside of you if you never share it? What good is this life inside of you unless you spend time with folks who need it? Not with the haughty and condemning and no. But like Jesus, neither do I condemn you. But God's got something better. Go and sin no more. Let me encourage you, folks. Let me encourage me and all of us that this is a battle for men's souls. And no soul is going to get won by a law getting passed in Nashville or a law getting passed in Washington, D.C. The only way that a soul gets won is through the love of God and the compassion of God, and the mercy of God, and the grace of God. And we ought to have so much love, and compassion, and mercy, and grace overflowing from our lives that everyone that we contact is affected by the love, and mercy, and grace, and compassion of God. No compromise. We don't change where we stand. We stand on the word of God. We stand on truth. We continue to proclaim the truth, but we don't do it with that judgmental, condemning attitude that drives people away from Jesus. Instead, we do it like Jesus did with an invitation, Come unto me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. We give them an invitation. To come after Jesus. Come follow Jesus. God's got something better for your life. And let me tell you my testimony. How God set me free from sin and set me on a new path. And then let's talk about how God can do the same thing for you. That's what God's calling us to. Taking a stand. Standing on the word of God. The truth of God's word without compromise, but overflowing with the love of God and the mercy of God and the grace of God to reach every person we can with the good news of Jesus Christ. That's his call for you and for me. Would you stand with me, please? Father, here we stand recognizing, like Paul said, that he was the chief of sinners. We recognize that if it weren't for you, we would still be bound in our sins. Father, forgive us when we've been condemning. Forgive us when we've been judgmental in ways that are not biblical. Forgive us when we have taken the right stand but fulfilled it in the wrong way. Oh, God, forgive us also when we've compromised, when we've backed off of the truth, when we've not said something, when we should have said something, when we should have taken a stand but we didn't because the pressure was too much or there was too much attention on us and and we were afraid of what the repercussions could be for our job or at school and, and we didn't take the stand we should have taken. God, both sins are sins. When we fudge on the truth or when we speak the truth without love, both are sin. So God, somehow, would you put your hand on us that we would be so full of the truth that we would refuse to compromise and yet so full of love that when we speak the truth, it will be on wings of love, touching every person with love, refusing to compromise and yet refusing to condemn, standing squarely on the word of God and overflowing with the love of God. Father, I'm reminded of what your word says. 
that the foundation of your throne is righteousness and justice and that love and mercy go before you. Lord, let it be said the same of us that our foundation is righteousness and justice and we stand on the truth of God. But Lord, let love and mercy go before us. Words and acts that are full of mercy and love and grace so that we don't drive people away from Jesus, but instead we invite people to Jesus. Oh God, change us and transform us so that we will no longer compromise and so that we will always love. Let it be so, both at the same time, through Christ, I pray in Jesus' name, amen. I love all of you so much. I know it's been a little different today with this topic, but do you know that I love you? Stand on the truth. And overflow with God's love. Have a blessed rest of the week. Don't forget to sign up in the back for our meal next week.